measure theory course. So chapter one is about measures, and I guess uh, we're going to talk now about sigma algebras. So, to give you a little motivation about sigma algebras, uh, which is kind of an abstract uh, concept, uh, initially what, what the idea is, uh, the idea is very simple. We'd like to define a measure on subsets of R. And we have a pretty good idea of what we want. We want that the measure of uh, the interval a, b, for instance, be b minus a. Okay, you have an open interval. You want uh, a measure like this. And, and then you know, uh, extend your definition to uh, you know, all subsets. So what about? other subsets. So you have your definition for an interval. And then you extend your definition to a union of intervals. That's not very difficult. You're going to add every piece, and uh, that's going to be your measure. Uh, then you're going to start taking limits infinite unions, intersections, and then mix everything. And then pretty soon you'll get something horrible. Uh, and you won't be able to measure it. It will not be measurable in the sense that what you want, the other properties that you want, uh, and so now I'm, I'm switching for, for a minute to, to three-dimensional space. What you'd like is that when you rotate your set, the measure doesn't change. When you translate it, it doesn't change either. I mean, some basic things about solids. But if you accept all the sets, then you are going to have big problems. And that was the big discovery of uh, Banach and Tarski. They, they showed the following. They showed that uh, it was possible to uh, define two uh, yeah it was possible to do the following to to define two sequences e i and f i that are congruent meaning that i can i i only need translation and rotation to go from e i to f i and if you call your if your your u of your union of e i is then uh, has a measure which is uh, arbitrarily small, so let me call it epsilon, and the union of f i. is going to have a measure much, much bigger than this one. So you are putting together these two unions, and the measures should be the same. And you end up with one thing which is as small as you want, and the other one which is as big as you want. So this was really the example that uh, got people thinking, well, we cannot admit all the sets in our measurable space. There are some sets in R and Rn which are too weird to be measurable. Okay, you, don't, you don't want them. So you want a large enough uh, space of sets, but not too large. And that's where the notion of sigma algebra comes. Okay. So what we're going to do basically is say, well, we're going to take open sets. Open sets are nice. But if you take only open sets, that's not good enough. Because when you, you do operations on open sets, you end up with things that are not open. 
So you want something more, but not too much. So we are going to generate something using open sets, and we'll see what, what we get. But we don't want all the possible sets. Okay? So that's, that's why we, we have this notion of sigma algebra. And so now we are going to, to talk about uh, the definition first. So a sigma a sigma algebra A on a set X is a subset of so this indicates all the uh, subsets of X, okay? But you, we usually don't want all of them. So we take a subset of that thing, and we have the following properties. A cannot be empty. You must have at least something in there. And if you take a sequence, so this time it's countable in A, then the union of this must be in A. And it must also be closed in, so if A belongs to the sigma algebra, then complement of A belongs to. So you need these three properties that are quite simple to have what we call sigma algebra. Now, uh, notice that the sigma algebra is a set of subsets. Okay, it's a collection of subsets of X. Right, examples of sigma algebra. You could take the whole partition of X. You could take all the possible subsets. Okay, that's the biggest sigma algebra you can you can take. You, why is this a sigma algebra? Well, it's clearly not empty because all the subsets of X are in there. Even if X is the empty set, uh, you still have the empty set in it, so it's not empty. Uh, if your EI belong to our subsets, then the union is necessarily a subset too. And if you have a subset, then its complement is also a subset. Okay, so this is clearly a sigma algebra. The other trivial example is to take the empty and X. So now we went from one extreme to the other. You cannot do smaller than that. And you cannot do bigger than that. Okay, so why is this uh, sigma algebra, well, it's different from the empty. It's, uh, if you take, well, if you, you see, you are going to take, uh, your EIs are either going to be empty or X. When you do union of these things, you either get empty if everybody is empty, or you get X. You cannot get anything else. Okay, so the union is in A, and the complement is also in A because the, the, the complement of the empty is X 
and the component of x is the empty. So nothing can, you cannot go out of uh, this set. Okay, now what else can we say about the sigma algebra? Uh, so properties. Uh, so A is a sigma algebra of X or in X. Uh, we, we have several properties. The empty set must belong to A. X must belong to A. Uh, what else? Well, for the time being, that's it. Oh, and the third one, the intersection, the countable intersection must belong to A2 if my sequence EI belongs to A. So let's, that is one, two, and three. So the proofs of that, well, actually it's easier to prove two first. So we know that A is not empty. Which means that there is an E in A. Okay, there is at least something in A. If E is in A, it means that the complement of E is in A. Which means that the union of E and its complement, which is X, is in A. So this proves two. My set X, the whole X, is necessarily in A. Okay, because we say that the countable union is in in my set, but of course you can you can take uh, you can you can take a finite uh, hmm. so I should have started with the empty set. Anyway, uh, that's a, a small point. The, when, when we're talking about countable union, it's, inclu it's also included a finite union. Okay? It's, it's either finite or countable. You still are in your sigma algebra. Okay, that's one thing. Now, once you know that x belongs to A, then the complement of x, which is empty, also belongs to A. And that proves uh, 1. And for 3, what you do is that you take, you take your sequence in A, and therefore, then, all the complement of all the complements are also in A because that's one of the properties of A and then the union of your complements is in A but the union of the complements is the same thing as the intersection of the complement of the intersection so this thing is in A Okay, you know that, right? Then I can do the complement of a complement and get what I want. I can do and this is going to be in A and this is going to be intersection of E I.
Okay? Because you, if you do a complement twice, it's like uh, doing nothing. Another easy property is that if you have a collection of sigma algebras, maybe I should use some other letter here. Um, Last time I taught this class, the students told me that the hardest part was to understand my uh, magic schools. So get used to it. So this is BA. I think they changed my class when I was really at a crucial period. And uh, that really messed my writing. I'm sorry. So BA is uh, a sigma algebra. And we are looking at a collection of sigma algebras. Then the intersection of BAs is also a sigma algebra. Okay, and the, the proof is well actually this is not quite true if I just say this. Uh, no, it's okay. Okay. So, how do I know that this thing is not empty? How do I know that it's not empty? Where well, x belongs to all of them, so it must belong to the intersection. Okay? We know that we, we have at least two elements in our sigma algebra, empty set and x. So, it's not empty because the empty set and the x belong, of course, one is enough, belong to all of them. So that's why it's not empty. Um, union, so if we take a collection, in the intersection, then the union Well, uh, okay, is going to belong to B A for every A, and therefore it's going to belong to E R uh, to the intersection of the B A's. And same is uh, also a triviality for if E belongs to the intersection, then E belongs to BA for every A, which means that E belongs to, uh, that complement of E belongs to BA for every A, which tells me that uh, complement of E belongs to the intersection of BA Okay, so by doing intersection of sigma algebras, you still uh, get a sigma algebra. Now, remember, our goal here is to generate a sigma algebra based on the open sets. So this idea of generating the smallest possible sigma algebra is going to be important. And what we're going to do is uh, so take um, take E inside your 
subsets. Then M of E is the smallest sigma algebra containing E. So what do I mean by smallest? Uh, so I should, uh, smallest means if A is a sigma algebra and E is included in A, then M of E must be in A. Okay, the smallest sigma algebra means that if you have your, if your E is in any sigma algebra, then the sigma algebra generated by E must be in A as well. Okay, now how do we know that this thing exists? Maybe there is no such thing as a sigma algebra containing E. You know, it's a little, uh, we have an existence problem, which is the cross of mathematicians. Well, uh, here it's easy. It's easy because what we can do is Define A uh, what do I want to do here? Yeah. I don't have enough letters. Uh, let's look at let's look at the intersection of A over all A's such that A is a sigma algebra and E is included in A. Okay, so I claim that this is exactly my M of E. So what I'm doing is looking at all the sigma algebras that have E in them. For instance, I know that at least P of X is in this set, okay? Because it's a sigma algebra, and certainly is in, E is included in P of X. P of X has all subsets. And I'm looking at, this, at, all the, at the intersection of all these guys. Well, I'm going to get the small most possible sigma algebra. We know the intersection of sigma algebra is a sigma algebra, so I don't have problems there. We know that E is going to be inside, since it's inside of every one of them. And we know that if we have another sigma algebra that contains E, it's necessarily in here because it's uh, taken over this intersection. So maybe you need to think a, a couple of minutes, but there is really not much to prove here. It's, uh, uh, it works well. I mean, when you, when you take this uh, intersection, you do get your, your minimum sigma algebra containing it. Okay, so definition. The Borel sigma algebra is the smallest sigma algebra containing all open sets of R. So that was what uh, we started thinking about. We're going to take all the possible open sets and generate the smallest possible sigma algebra that contains them. 
the notation to that is B like Borel and R for, because that's where we are. And now it's going to be important to realize that we don't really need to look at all the open sets. We can look at our favorite open sets, like open intervals, because it's going to give us the same thing. So that's what we're going to do next. So, uh, property, uh, let's define so BR is M of EI for E1 would be all the open intervals. E2 are over closed intervals. E3 are the semi closed intervals. E4 are the ones closed on the other side. E5 minus infinity A, A belonging to R. So you see, these, these are open sets, but they are not all the open sets. They are very particular open sets. What you are saying is that if you take only the, these open intervals, you are still going to get all of BR. You are not going to get anything smaller. If you take the closed sets, you also get BR, because there is a close relationship between open and closed, since you can take complements and get the open set from a closed set, and so on. Okay? So we'll do a couple, and the rest uh, we'll, you'll have to do for your homework. So proof of that. So for A, what, what are we going to do? To do. First thing, let so what we want. Uh -huh. Yeah, I forgot about. Yeah, in order to do that, to to do all those, uh, we need. That's the definition. Okay. Well, it's almost the definition. So, in order to prove this, we need a lemma. And the lemma says the following If E is included in A and A is a sigma algebra, Then L of E is also included in A. So if you set E is included in A, then when you generate a sigma algebra, you still are in here. But that's exactly what's written here. Right? Because what we're saying here is that in order to get M of E, we need to look at all the sigma algebras that contain E. So this guy here 
is in this intersection. And therefore, it's going to be bigger than this. Okay, so this is really a fundamental fact about how you generate M of E. Do you see it? Because here, to, we, what we are saying is that to get M of E, we look at this intersection. Therefore, if I take one of these guys, it must be, it must include this guy here because this is the intersection over all these guys. So it's, uh, it's exactly this fact here that we have. But it's a good idea to have it uh, stated like that because it's going to be useful. So to, to prove A, for instance, uh, the first thing is uh, what we are going to do first is to show, OK, we can show that M of E1 is in B of R. But that's easy. So first thing, E1 is included in so I'm saying that E1 is included in BR okay why is that well e, we have open sets in uh, E1 and all open sets are in BR because BR not only has the open sets, but everything else needed to get the sigma algebra. Okay? So this is true since all open sets are in BR. Now, we use the lemma, and we say that M of E1 is included in BR, because this is a sigma algebra. Okay, So if E1 is in the sigma algebra, then M of E1 is in the same sigma algebra. So we have one inclusion. M of E1 must be in BR. Okay. Now, to get the other inclusion, so for the reverse inclusion, you need uh, the following. Let O be all open sets of R. Let's take A in O, then A is a union of open intervals. That's the thing we prove, that every open set in R is a union of open intervals. Which means that A is a union of uh, elements of E1. Therefore, A must belong to M of E1. Because when I do union of elements of E1, I must still be in M of E1. Maybe I'll, I'll be not in E1 anymore, but certainly I'll be in the sigma algebra generated by E1 because that sigma algebra takes elements, and when you do element, when you do union, you still are in the same set. You cannot get out of it. Therefore, you must be in here. Or if you prefer, you could say that these are elements of E1, but E1 is included in M of E1. And once you do your union of elements of M of E1, by definition of a sigma algebra, you're still in M of E1. This shows what? That O is included in M of E1. And therefore, 
m of o must be included in m of e1. This is again the lemma. OK? So for every one of those, you need to do a double inclusion. This one is the easiest. Uh, for instance, you'll, ha you'll need to, uh, for the proof of E2, Uh, it's uh, oh, one thing important will be to prove that A, B is the union of A minus 1 over N, B over all possible. Okay, so prove that and then do a reasoning of this type. I know that I can get all my uh, sets of this type. The, these, these sets are union of open intervals. If they are op union of open intervals, they are in the sigma algebra generated by open intervals. And therefore, I get one inclusion by doing that. So every time, you have to do things of this type. For E5, for instance, Uh, you can minus infinity a is going to be the union over all n's of minus n a. You are going to get all the all the sets by doing that. Okay. So homework for next time. Prove b c d and E. Questions? Okay, so let's stop here for today.
and we say that m of e1 is included in br because this is a sigma algebra. Okay, so if e1 is in the sigma algebra, then m of e1 is in the same sigma algebra. 